All right. Hello, hello, YouTube and true believers. This is season one, episode two, a watch and paint dry. Today we're going to be painting on uh, the Ogren Burkur base. He's a uh, privateer press mercenary figure that uh, the client happened to have the special press ganger copy of. Here's the figure himself there. He has the, you bring the bodies, we bring the game, custom shield. Uh, and he's going to be resting upon a dock that I've sculpted here. You can see here we have our uh, primed base here with the skulls and the vegetation and some what are going to be gold coins down there. And then uh, he's going to rest on top. We've also uh, taken time here to sculpt a little shredder fish, uh, kind of a take on the shredder from the Legion of Everblight, since this is the force that uh, the mercenary figure is going to be playing with. And he's got a little goldfish in his mouth there, because he's uh, having a snack, and he's going to rest in the under scene here. Today we're going to paint up this base, and then we're going to uh, fill this about three quarters of the way with a murky resin. And then uh, the resin will be a water effect that'll give this whole base some depth and some stability and weight too. So it'll be a uh, you know a pretty scenic deal when everything is said and done. And that's what we like. We like scenic bases for sure. Something that I'm known for. Uh, a lot of people commission my work because of the you know I'm a diorama guy predominantly. But, uh, all right, let's get started anyway here. So, since it's a privateer press figure, I'm going to use slightly more privateer press paints than I normally would in a project. Uh, I like to um, tie the pieces to the manufacturer uh, using the color schemes that uh, they would use. Well, not necessarily the schemes, but the materials they would use to replicate, like the sheen of their paint, right, and the... Uh, the various tones that you can mix together using the line of the manufacturer. And I mean, you can get the same effects. You know, I have several lines of paint, uh, so it's not like you need to, but it, it just feels right to me on some weird level. But we're going to start with the brown of the under earth, and we're going to paint this a really dark brown. And we're going to cover it with weathering pigments uh, stuck in a high gloss gel medium to kind of make it a. Uh, muddy down there but uh, we're going to start with uh, privateer presses umbral umber right this is a nice dark brown has some warm notes which play well in a swamp you know uh you want to think about the various kinds of uh nutrients and the you know the soil deposits around a uh a swamp which would have a lot of vegetation that's decayed in it and when that comes to mind it just uh, seems to call for a warmer mud. Like if this was an ice scene, right? I'd be uh, going for something a little more neutral without the warmth. And the warmth isn't really coming through on the palette cam there. But, uh, and it won't come through on top of this black really either. And we're just going to just fill in all this here. Don't have to be too worried about being sloppy. Uh, this is just the underlayer here. We're going to be painting the skulls and the vegetation and the coins and the posts. So all of that will be touched up in time there. Just getting this brown down here. Using the side of our brush to paint like always. You want to save that tip for when you're putting the eyelashes on a net. Brush quality is important too. This is actually a beater version of uh, the Windsor and Newton. I've been using this one for a couple of months, and you can still see the point. Uh, 
it gets on the thing. It is a, a fine quality brush, especially with proper maintenance. I am a brush licker. Uh, if you all continue to watch my feeds, you're just going to have to acquaint yourself with the fact I, uh, I have all kinds of paint additives coursing through my veins. Back through here. And this, um, honestly, doesn't need to be the most even of coats in and of itself because we're just backing brown weathering pigment, which is also a warm brown, with this brown here. It's like the, uh, the base coat of, if you will. And it's more for tone than coverage. So there are going to be spots of it peeking through under the weathering pigment, but it's definitely not going to be the primary color point or what's most visible when we're done down here. in in our brown grab a little more here now these privateer paint press paint pots aren't my favorite in the industry by any stretch of the imagination but if you get yourself some stainless steel rust resistant ball bearings and you toss them in those pots you can agitate the paint real easily there's lots of room for the uh thing to bang around so that mix mixing your paint up with a few shakes it's much less laborious than it could be i don't know about you guys but i don't think looking like i'm using a uh, shake weight over here is a particularly good look for this stream splashing paint around here the outside lip here, right, is going to be painted over after we're done with our resin pour. We're going to block the base off around the exterior using painter's tape, which, you know, has a chance of removing the primer, but also has a chance of some of the resin slipping down in between the bond of the tape and the base rim there, so... If we get any spots where that happens, we'll sand it and then we'll repaint the thing black, which isn't really that big of a deal. I use a uh, brush-on sealant for these display quality pieces I paint for people. It's an Army Painter. It is the uh, Army Painter Anti-Shine. And uh, it is just uh, fantastic stuff. I was turned on to it by James Wapel. And uh, as far as like uh, material tips, uh, it's one of the best ones I've ever gotten from another artist. Plus, it kind of, uh, you know, if you mix brands of paint a lot like I do. Uh, it unifies the various sheens on them down to a very, very matte. And it does so without making them, like, uh, dusty. You see some matte finishes, especially some matte sprays in the aerosol. They will give you some really powdery, ruined miniatures. And then you have some brush on products that'll do the same because they are white when you look at them in the bottle and you're relying then on the curing process to turn them clear. Whereas the Army Painter Anti-Shine 
is clear right in the bottle. So even if you do get an imperfect finish due to humidity or something like that, you're not going to end up with a model that looks like it was uh, covered in powdered glass. Unless, of course, that's what you're going for, which I mean, if you're, you know, doing like an ice axe or something like that, you can pile up little bits of frost using acrylic gloss medium and powdered glass. But, you know, we're pretty far from those environs and the scope of this project right now, so. And you'll notice that. I only take out a brush full of paint for the palette at a time, really. Uh, I like to conserve the stuff. And you can always take out more, but once it's on your palette, it's committed to the project. Just working. Just a few remaining spots in here that need to be brown. And we'll watch all of this too, I think, to get a little depth there with a little Agrax Earthshade Citadel. When I started out um, as a painter, I used Citadel paint almost exclusively. But, uh, you know, over the years, my preferences have changed. Uh, and I. Still have a few favorite colors of those that I employ, you know, in the arsenal, but uh, I don't hardly use one of their paints when I have another option anymore, with the exception of their line of washes. I, I just love them. And I don't know that they're necessarily better than any other washes, or the use of inks for that matter, but uh, you know, there's something nostalgic about them. There we go. That's looking pretty brown there. Good enough for going for it, at the very least. All right. Get a coffee here. And now, let's get a base coat in on the skulls. Um, for the skulls, since we're going the privateer press route, I'm going to go with a little Menoff white base. And you can see, um, it's one of the reasons I don't like the privateer press pots. If you've had them for a couple of years, the paint just builds up in the lip due to the pot design, right? And then eventually you go to close the thing and the lid splits. And then you're wasting paint that you're losing to the drying process. It's like a planned obsolescence thing, especially since there are so many, uh, you know, dropper bottles that don't have these problems. Grab a little bit of our men off white base there. The uh, Privateer Press system of paints doesn't use triads, really. I mean, they have some three-color uh, sets, you know, but uh, they mostly do two-color pairings, you know, with a light and a dark version, which, uh, you know, then you're expected to intermix with other colors to get your own ratios. It's a good system, but it's not as intuitive as some of the others. Reaper makes fine paints, and they do uh, triads, where you have the three colors pre-mixed for you. And for people that aren't trying to think about color theory, if you're just getting into miniatures now, the, uh, you know, it's a system that is way more appealing. If you are trying to get to the next level, though, uh, Color theory is just essential. 
we're going to be seeing a lot of color theory coming up when we actually paint Ogren Bakur, the guy standing on top of this dock. But all this stuff is going to be suspended in kind of a murky brownish green water, you know. So we want to take that into account when we dedicate, you know, the amount of detail we're going to do down here that's going to be obscured, right? And also how that's going to affect the relationships of the colors that lie within it. And again, we can paint these pretty sloppily right now because we're going to come back and we'll finish them up. When painting like these light colors, your bone colors and your topes and your, you know, khakis on top of black, I find it's best to do it in these like uh, sloppy layers, right? Because you're going to need a couple of layers to get even coverage here. And so you're going to want to go back in between these as they dry, you know, kind of like an assembly line. And if you're painting, you know, games workshop pieces, there's like a skull quota. So you will have several to uh, fill in. It's all gonna run. See, this is an old beater brush that I've had for several months because after a little bit of abuse here, this tendril pops off. Rinse it out. I like to run my brush in the crook of my pinky uh, to get a tip established and then finish it in the mouth. But that's because I'm a brush licker, so. And rotate. And again, due to that split lid on this Menoth base, that lid's been split now for about four months. So the paint is starting to separate and evaporate due to the, you know, oxygen that gets in there. And this is a little thinner than it normally is on the pot. A wet palette helps with the consistency. Like I said earlier, we're just going around, filling in skulls. I've debated there being like a uh, ripple effect from the shafts of light, but I don't think the water is clear enough, it's going to be clear enough in this instance to really justify the sun scattering there. In a way, these sloppy stages are kind of fun. So, requires much less precision. Just getting paint down there, having a good time. It's the later stages that get a little hectic. Now we're starting to get some good coats there. Those schools sit for a second and get started on our greens. I think we're going to, well, that's about the five minutes. It is swamp after all. We're going to double off here. The base coat of Privateer Press Gnarls Green and then uh, highlights an Ortic Olive, probably with a little bit of our Man Off base stirred in. Just because it's already in the palette for one and for two, it will tie those together. 
And we just run a brush real quickly outside of our terrible, terrible mess. And look at that, it's not even a mess anymore. Magic eraser. Sands the infant poisoning melanin. Ta da. Now it's like you never even messed up. I find that way quicker than going in and, uh, you know, unerring precision every time. Mind you, if I'm doing like a freehand tattoo, like we'll be getting into in a later episode here, that, uh, you know, does require first time precision. Or you're wasting a lot of time there. All right, going with the gnarls green. Getting a little shake weighty with it. But not nearly as much as you would be without one of those ball bearings, allow me to assure you. Get a nice pool of the green going. Definitely gonna up focus my palette here. Let's see. Palette cam's not really being glorious enough, is it? Problem right there. There we go. That's much closer to true color. Uh, all right. Well, that will do it. All right. Moving on. Still working out the kinks on the old stream here. These are the uh, bracken, barbed bracken from the uh, Citadel 25 buck boxes they just released recently. And uh, I've never painted an Eldar anything in my life. But uh, these were a very fascinating alien looking plant box. And I thought, you know, that looks really aquatic as well. So who knows what the, uh, you know, underwater plant life looks like on a, a Legion of Everblight area. And whatever the Iron Kingdoms, I guess is what they call it. Universe there. I'm not really hip on the Privateer Press lore. Just enough to be able to hold a conversation with clients, really. Tried a few games, and uh, it's just mighty competitive for me. It's not to say that it's not good for people that are into, you know, competitive things. But I've always been more of a co-op player myself. They've released a whole edition since I last played the game.
right, to the side of a brush now, laying down the greens. And these are mighty saturated, right? They got some blue notes in this green here, right? It's real deep and live green. And we're going to dole that out with our accent color some. And the contrast between the greens in this, or the blues in this, and the yellows and the green we lay on top of it are going to make these ridiculous details pop a bit. And the inside of these leaves here, we're only going to paint the base color because they're going to be in shadow, right, in the innermost part of our murky water. It's going to be a giant fish in the middle. And they're going to be directly away from whatever light source the resin's being looked at. So there's no sense in really doing a ton of work. Uh, oops, that was the palette cam. Because that work will be, uh, you know, rendered invisible by the stuff we are going to put a lot of work into. I already have put some work into. I'm not uh, a couple of days for me to sculpt those fish because I'm not a good sculptor at all by any stretch of the imagination. I'm starting to become a good enough sculptor that I can cover up the glaring mistakes in my sculpts with the fact that I'm a good painter. But uh Yeah, I'm not going to be doing, you know, David anytime soon. Michelangelo. Right. So now we got a uh, you know our base coat going on the greens there. We'll rinse out our brush and we'll go back and we'll pitch up our skulls again. Because that's what miniature painting is. It's a never ending series of uh, touch-ups. It's one of the things I found craziest about the activity when I first got started. You know, I threw a uh, base coat and a wash on some scavens, and I'm like, look at how done these guys are. And then I went online to Cool Mini or not. So what people were really doing with miniatures. And I said, well, how could that possibly be? Ended up reading a lot on the subject and testing out a lot of stuff, and I realized, oh, it's just that everything has 70 more steps. That's kind of a, uh, you know, hard decision time there. Are you going to develop the uh, patience to do uh, those 70 extra steps? Or, uh, are you going to quit painting your aspiration to painting miniatures at a high level? Yeah. Skulls are getting to have a pretty solid base coat. Color is nice and even, and they'll take a wash so much better if you just make sure that you have a nice even base coat.
even though, as always, I rotate the miniature, not the position I'm holding my brush. You'll find you have much more precision if you use your brush in your handwriting position than if you do if you try and rotate it all over the line. come back too fast to one of the layers of paint, all you do by adding more paint is push the existing paint around. Patience is pretty important. Rinse it out our brush. And then we're going to go back to our green here. And just make sure our exterior coats are nice and even. Gravateur paints have fine coverage, but uh, they still take a couple of layers. Truth be told, the only real complaint I have with the paints is the pots that they sell them in. That, and they're much less accessible in uh, the part of Texas I live in than Reaper paints or Games Workshop paints. Or even Vallejos, for that matter. And Vallejo is just my, pretty much my default. Excellent. Now for the dock, I'm going to paint it this thornwood green, which is a much more of a brown than a green. So this will be a nice base coat. A nice aged barn wood. It's kind of gray. Really low saturation. Which is kind of like the faintest greenest hue. We're going to wash this with some browns. And then we're going to use those Vallejo weathering layers. Showing you from earlier. I'm painting along the grooves that I put in the wood. The wood here is just dowels, you know, just normal round dowels. That I took a dental pick and dragged a texture into to simulate the wood grain. That's uh, pretty important if you're going for the, uh, you know, the old weather farm like I am. Plus algae, weather barn plus algae. Just more moisture in the scene. These Citadel plastic plants are fascinating too because they're made out of a malleable plastic that you can just bend into whatever shape you like. And uh, I found them incredibly useful. 
for that reason. Cross beams here, popsicle sticks that have just been, you know, molded to shape. And also weathered with a dental pick. Just like everything, especially when covering black, you know, uh, anticipate that you're going to have a couple of layers you need to put in. Especially when you increase the surface area of what you're painting by putting lines in it, you know, little divots where the paint has to fill more space than it would if it was just a two-dimensional plane. It's going to be a mighty thirsty spot. Okay, let's get the cross beam going here. And I have these spots here that I masked off on the top of the thing because those are going to be our adhesion points for the uh, guy sitting on top of the dock. And we're going to seal those with, it's going to be super glued down, and we're going to make a composite moss that we're going to paste underneath here so that it, you know, looks mossy, which will help sell the illusion that it's a super weathered dock and also reinforce the structure. It's going to be made of a glue. Don't paint a lot of metal models anymore just because of the prevalence of the plastic casting and the quality increase just generally over the last, I guess, decade especially. And, uh, this fellow happens to be metal because he was one of the limited edition casts. So you always have to take an extra mind in, the, you know, how you're going to structurally reinforce your base details, you know, when they get elaborate the way that uh, this one's going to. Especially when you're using a bunch of composites of materials, you know. I have plaster. Mixed with an acrylic gel down there to form the, uh, you know, the dirt, along with little chunks of grit. Uh, you know, I have the plastic from the plants and the skulls. I have wooden metal because this dock is pinned together. All the popsicle sticks, when they're cut and weathered, they also then get soaked in thin super glue. Tends to make them more rigid, they'll hold a detail better. And uh, it's important that it's the thin, watery, super runny. Stick your fingers together immediately, super glue though. So that when you apply it to the exterior, it doesn't eat any of the uh, holes you've put in your you know, wooden texture there, like a thicker gel medium one would. more thorn wood in our lives.
I didn't texture the interior of these braces at all because uh, that's going to be completely obfuscated by not only the shadow of the dock resting on top of the piece, but the fish below it. Nobody is going to put any eye time on that part of this model, so let's not put the brush time on it. That isn't to say you should ever leave anything unpainted. But just that you can be smart about where you spend your detail and where you spend your focal points. At least outside of competition. In again. It's fantastic. And we're gonna wash these in that nice dark agrax earth shade and then we're going to green them up with algae this is just our base pass going through here and just working in those brown These steps tend to be the most tedious, right? We're not really, you know, creating just yet at this stage in your paint job. You're laying the foundation to create. But every building needs a solid foundation. Every good paint job needs a nice solid base layer. I really feel like I should get some license for your music to play to fill the silence, but then I'm going to talk over the music. This turns into a yellow match back here. There's still some kinks to work out of the stream for sure. We'll get there. Hopefully together. Starting to come together now. And, yeah, very brown. Not a very fun brown. It's not a very fun scene, if I'm being 100%. It's a dude standing, looking all stern. You know, hoisting his giant harpoon and shield. And then a little fish getting murdered for lunch. Still, it is an interesting story. Just a little something going on in the backdrop, you know? You need like a, uh, a gag in every base, I feel like. 
certainly where I win my awards, I think, is the narratives that I try and add to the pieces more than even than any like uh you know skill at this point. If I had to say the thing that I think I'm best at in all of this, it would be telling the story, not so much the building the story and painting the story. It's a little more of our thorn green here. Just in every step, over and over again, until they're all good to go. This is the glamorous part of the miniature life. It's not all glamour. Some of it's just patience. One of the things that I like most about the activity is that I find that in addition to doing these like uh, tasks like this, you get to be alone with your mind for a while, kind of drift off on any old subject you're pondering, learn profound truths about yourself and the universe. At least they seem that way at the time. God. This stuff. A little more here on our exterior. Remember, the more even your base coat is, the better the project can turn out. Every step matters. Especially on the exterior of these poles. These are going to be the visible points. And they will be very, 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 very close to the surface of the water on every side so it's not as though the murkiness of the water is going to obscure anything in there in particular instances and more than that they kind of uh form the basis for the piece you know so they're going to be very focal People's eyes are drawn down into the pool to see what's going on with the fish, you know. They have to work their way around each of these. And the skulls and our gold coins and, uh, you know, the whole thing. He's a piratey figure. So that's why we got the gold coins going on down there. And the whole aquatic theme in general. And then, you know, it's a he's stern, so he gets the skulls too to emphasize the seriousness of the scenario. Starting to get it prime saturation down here. Excellent. Let's 
that for just a minute to dry here. I normally use a hair dryer at this point, but you know, I'm trying to avoid the insane noises on the feed. Oh, we'll blow on the thing some. A little low rent hair dryer. So now we're gonna move over to Citadel briefly here. And do I necessary step, yeah. And the agrix earth These tend to settle quite a bit at the bottom. You can see the sediment in there, so give them a good shake. They're really liquid, so they integrate very quickly and don't exactly need the uh, agitator bead, but... And it helps if you don't just toss the thing, too. But now it's well agitated, you see there. That was the whole point and purpose right there. So we will start with the Agrax Earthshade here. And you see how it pools up and forms on the lip there? That's all you need. Make sure your bristles are still damp. Especially if you're taking a minute in between using your brush like we have there. Whoops. And then we just saturate it. All right. Run it around. Here, darkening all this down. This is going to add a little definition to our undercoat here. It's going to fill in the darker areas. So that there will be a lot of variety done down. Kind of just creating our shadows for us where we let it pool up ever so slightly. Which is pretty much the point of a wash in. I mean, sometimes you're using it to change the tone of a color, but that is not terribly common with washes. That's more of an Inks and metallics are especially cool together. And if you paint over the coins with the wash, it doesn't matter because we haven't even touched them yet. So, oops. And just get the last little patch here. Now, since washes are thinner, right, they flow a little further up into your bristles than a paint does. You want to keep all that out of your ferrule. So make sure to really rinse your brush out before moving on to your next color. We're going to move 
on to Seraphim Sepia here. Drop from the lid. And I see how this sepia isn't just filling on our excesses there. It's kind of warming this wood. Making it just a little kind of umber. And that is going to play real well visually against the greens we're going to lay into the thing. We might even light the tops. Oh, we don't this too. You know, because they're the one sun exposed where the rest of this is submerged. You should always be trying to think about everything you can do to sell your effect. Whether it's a dude being ripped in half or, you know, old ancient wood. submerged in water. Of course it's going to get that algae build up. This isn't a well-maintained dock at the vineyard. This is a, you know, some backwood hauler on Louisiana airboat kind of dock. Need to watch out for gators. Not alligators, but gators. This is gator country dock. We're going to make that quite a bit. You can already start to see some of that interest between the, uh, you know, the greens there and as the sepia develops in this wood next to it. Two kind of stand oppositionally on the uh, color wheel. But we're working with really desaturated versions of the colors too, so it's not like, uh, you know, the Joker where your greens and your oranges are gonna pop out against each other along with some purple. It's more subtle than that, but in its subtlety, you kind of win the day. Not that there aren't times for extreme contrast. The piece I'm painting after this one is actually the Hulk, the scene from Ultimate Wolverine vs. Hulk, where he's actually tearing Wolverine in half. And there are, are a lot of really violent, vibrant and violent contrasts in the colors there, you know, versus the comic book Chroma. And I'll definitely be playing with a much greater saturation there. That's a primer color work too, you know? Now there. You see how it's bringing all these recesses in there as it pools ever so slightly in those divots. You start to get that cracked wood look to a much greater extent. Again, we don't need this to be immaculately even, because if there's some patchiness, well, that makes sense, don't it? I mean, it's been patchily weathered throughout the years. But it is good to focus on establishing a good code everywhere. And now we're going to take it, we're going to do the same thing for our skulls here, right? You'll really be able to see the wash. Let's pop out this thing too. Let's just poop just like that. Build them up. Really good. 
I like to let it rest a lot sloppily on skulls because then it dries with those patches where it's uh you know kind of like the skull still had the meat on it as it became older and older and some of the patches are darker not just because they lie in shadow but because you don't have a perfectly bleached skull here you have one that came to its final rest in a less than pristine position school sit for a minute. You can see after the wash is dry in here though we got the base is already nearly dried out there which is good. I think I'm going to snap my feet over for just a moment to my fade out screen so that I can actually blow dry this and get on with the next step. Well, no, I can actually do the vegetation right here real quick. And that'll take even less blow dry. So now we're stepping up here to our Ordic Olive. Do the shake weight treatment on her. There we go. important to be mindful of how much paint you have on your brush and when your wash is still wet as well it's part of learning the tools understanding when it is too wet to use you overload the brush you can't control the volume of the paint coming off the tip Just creating like our intermediate contrast here. We're gonna keep the center of these leaves real dark green. We're gonna brighten up as they go to the outside there. Not for any real reason. I'm not basing this on a real world plant I've seen, but if you just paint them the one color of green, you're not really doing them service we got the scale here it's uh you know gonna be hard to see and nobody at the end of the day is going to be critiquing the exterior of your vegetation and your underwater scene but you'll know And it's not like it's that much work. And we're going to mix a little bit 
this ortic olive green with a little bit of that Menoth white base we had in there from the skulls earlier. Some of this down here is good. There is the dying vegetation down here. Number two, that this is going to be covered by a much more eye popping spectacle. That doesn't mean you can't come through here and just add little, little notes. When he's dry too, this order of dries much more subtly than it goes on wet. You can see our seraphim sepia is really starting to dry out on our skulls here. I thought Port of Olive is thinner in consistency than a lot of the other Graviteer Press paints I own, so it requires even a few more layers for coverage. Which is weird, you know, generally you expect all the paints in a line to be, you know, consistent and things like consistency. But every now and then, even the good lines have colors that are just a little, you know, just a little off. And in some cases, you just got an off pot, and in other cases, it's the actual color itself that is just not formulated correctly. And not even incorrectly, just differently than the rest of the colors in the line. Don't get me wrong, I think Ortic Olive is a lovely green. 
foot thought I got is thinner than the rest of my paint, so. Alright. There we go. It's looking pretty good. While we're waiting for the sepia to finish off, why don't we go in and head up our gold? Pretty gold on these here. Bases. For that, I need to grab my DL75 metallics, which uh, I have available to you in the last hot day of the week. Which is located. Lots of metallic paints on the market. I'm a big fan of both Vallejo Model Air and the Scale 75 metallics. They just, uh, they really do it to it. So, we're going to be using true metal metallics in this piece. And for our gold coins, we're going to be using the Scale 75 range. All right, so we're going to use Scale 75 Victorian brass to base the things. And I know, but Will, that's brass. Yeah, that's fine. It's, uh, you know, we'll brown our gold with a little accent there. And uh, then dwarven gold from Scale 75 as well. Now, these Scale 75 paints are lovely, but boy, do they ever separate. So, they get the ball bearings. And even more shake weight treatment than other paints that I have with wall bearing mixers. A little sip of coffee. Now you may wonder why my uh, palette streams are all super crisp in HD and my face stream isn't. And that's because, you know, well, first of all, you guys aren't here to look at my face, really. This is just an accent. And secondly, it's just an ancient web camera. Eventually, I'm hoping to, uh, you know, have these streamlined enough and popular enough to be able to uh, get better recording equipment out of them. But that is dozens and dozens of episodes into the future, probably. Assuming I ever get a following at all. But, you know, 33 followers, that ain't all bad. Hard to be too mad about that. Considering I've done... Uh, you know, like one episode of this previously. So. There we go. Same as before. And you can see these scale 75s are just like pools of liquid metal. It's awesome. Go in and just we're going to base coat our gold coins with this here. Pretty simple stuff. And we don't really have to worry about getting the outside rims of the coins like we would if they were above water. A, we still have a weathering pigment stage coming through here. And B, murky water, like a broken record. You don't have to put all the effort into it because the water's going to steal the show. I feel like I've said that. Like, uh, a thousand times, but that doesn't make it any less accurate than the first. You gotta constantly find something to prattle on about here. Oh, we missed a spot on the back of the skull. We will have to address that. Dun dun dun. Mm 
Oop, a little gold to the side there, and that's all right. We still got our brown. Old slippage. But again, base coat and all this doesn't matter. None of this matters yet. But when does it start to matter? Ask. It's a real question, isn't it? The exception here is the exterior lip. So exterior facing ones here. Go in. Good. Now paint the outside. Let's people know it's a three dimensional. It's really important we get even coverage on our metallics, right? Because our metallics reflect light. Any patchiness in that at all, but one spot isn't as reflective as the other. Starts to spoil the effect quite quickly. You get that grainy metal you see on some people's stuff. Used to get it on my stuff, too. I remember every step is one of 70 steps. All right. Let's go through there and touch up the brown again. Don't want our gold melting into our ground. Excellent. Gold's in just another minute or two there. Let's go through here. Finish the highlight on our veg. Alright, so we'll take a little bit of this order olive. Alright, stick it right here. Take a little bit of this men off white. Stick it right here. Lighten these two up. Get a nice marriage going on there. Now, and then just the exterior, exterior bits here now. That's what's on camera. Creating a monochromatic triad. Just walking the greens up, son. Is that when people see him, they go, oh, look, he did something. 
is really these are just the smallest of accents. They shouldn't take any focus at all. Just kind of stem the effect going here. To be even, because you're simulating a little kind of not lumpy texture, but roughly stem. Add your accent. Excellent. Such fine details. This was all above water. I'm picking out way more here. Since it's definitely not just adding the faintest traits, extinguishing characteristics. Good action. Now we are going to coat our skulls in some Anthonian camo shade. Another Citadel wash. That uh, is a kind of very ruddy green. I'm not going to do this over the entirety of our skulls, but we have to imagine that they've been moldering down there for a while and aren't just going to be your standard sepia. Pick up kind of a mossy undertone there. Do this specifically on like the uh, you know the face surface. 
just here, add a little more depth, a little more character. And just the slightest interplay between the, the orange tones and the green tones there. I like to do the undersides with a heavier green than the top. I kind of envision like a mossiness peeping up from below. And also, then you're like uh, playing with the uh, bounce lights that would be coming off the green brown uh, under. But I mean, this is all super subtle, too. Probably too subtle for the underwater scene, but. You know, what are you doing while well, I'm doing that here? Just gonna darken ever so slightly the inside of these leaves. Tie a little bit of a distinction of the layers together there. Coat them all. It, uh, you know, binds the lighter greens and the darker greens under the wash. And soften some of the transitions just a little. Keeps it super grim dark. Even though this is technically not a 40k piece. It's still pretty grim dark. And I'll take a few passes for this green to start to really develop itself. Again, it's just one step of 70. We've been down this path. Oh, look at that. I got some gold all the way up there. And it makes my... I'm a real pro. Our skulls do not where we want them. Why don't we step up the next step on our gold? Move into the dwarven gold. And here we're going to be painting our exterior parts of the coin here in the gold. The ones that get closest to the light. It's going to give just this hint of extra reflectiveness. And I cannot paint this coin without painting that rock. Going brown again in a minute. Doing a hint of extra reflectiveness towards the viewer. And also, if we can help it on the bottom facing side of the coin so that the highlight is pooling in the bottom of whatever curvature on the surface there. It adds to the illusion, illusion that it is uh, capturing light and reflecting it like chrome or something. They're much brighter. The highlight worked in.
Scale 75's white alchemy at this point. And even though these are true metallics, they provide their own reflectivity. You want to help a little, you know, it's just the smallest little bit of this white reflection here. Really make these belts pop. And of course, we're centralizing that in the little refractive highlight we've defined here. It's white metal. Really helps it look like you got a pinpoint capture and light and throwing it back. Especially when you still want these to show up as shiny in a pool of liquid. What we're gonna have going here. Don't take so brush out. Go back drag some dwarf gold because you want these pinpoint specular highlights real fine, real small. Barely even there. We all need to get Less is more. It really just catches the light now. Touch up that brown or some. Distinction between the two. Go back through here on our dried skulls. Get a little bit of this man off base here. It's a highlight. Just a highlight. Bring them back to the back man off base there. Skull here, ever so slight, just this detail. The two being added, just making them interesting, kind of flatten out under all those washes. We're gonna bring them back to their state of glory. Focusing on the areas where there's some textural definition, you know, the eye sockets here, around the nose, top of the lip, teeth.
Right along whatever lights she had going on in there. It's a subtle difference, but I mean, you know, subtly can win the day. So I'm just going to be getting the moss treatment too, algae treatment. So don't break your back as long as you know that you're on step three and 67 left. The more work you do, the detail you get going, the better the ultimate wow factor, you know? All right. Damn good start. Now, we're going to mix us some weathering pigments. Uh, I've used quite a few weathering pigments at this stage in the game. But I just kind of fell in with uh, secret weapon miniatures. They just, you know, it's good stuff. It's easy to use. Uh, consistent, which I like quite a bit. And uh, so for our weathering pigment mud and muck here that we're going to be making, we're just going to use. Uh, two secret weapon pigments, secret weapons dark earth, and the secret weapon sewage muck. And then we're going to be using a uh, gloss medium, which in my case is Mod Podge. Mod Podge Gloss Lustre. Uh, I use Mod Podge for all kinds of stuff in my water effects. I think it's just the bee's knees, but uh, you can use a heavy body acrylic gel, uh, crackle medium, uh, all kinds of different things to get this effect going here. It does not require the uh, Mod Podge necessarily. So, I'm going to make our mud I have here this dry palette. You know, a lot of people put their paint in this. I mix pigments and whatnot in this. And this is going to beat the hell out of a brush. So, instead of using my nice painting brushes, right, we're going to use one of these uh, nylon jobbers from a hobby shop. You get like uh, four for a. Uh, you know, dollar or whatever. And we're going to get the brush wet because even on these cheapo brushes, always keep your bristles, bristles damp, your bristles damp. And we're just going to take. Oh, need to find a better spot for these tools. And take us some of this dark earth here and just drop it right there. You know, it's just a really fine pastel-like powder. And then we're going to take some of our sewage muck. Much less here, because we want this to be mostly brown. Just a touch of green, a little trace of green in there. Sprinkle that in. Cut these dudes together here. Maybe just touch more of the green.
and they don't have to be immaculately uh, mixed in with one another because then you'll get a little more tonal variation than you would where they are homogeneous gradient. Pop open our Mod Podge here. A few bristles full. A couple of drops of water. Uh, generally, when applying weathering pigments, I use rubbing alcohol. Since we're making like a slurry here. A little more brown as the green really took over there. Well, you know, you got a little trial and error going on here. There we go. Nice slurry. Remember, this is a beater brush. Don't do this with good brushes. And we got a nice mucky paste going on there. I'm just going to use this just as it is there. Just come through here and build out some murky, mucky patches. It's down here is dry ground, it's mud. Not really a better way to go about that than make some mud, you know? And some interesting green brown that breaks up the kind of monotonous browns we had laid underneath there. Find if you don't do this when you uh, pour your resin on top. Looks like if the resin's just sitting on top of dry ground, or it just has its own kind of mucky, mushy feel to it. Then when you pour your resin in on top, it looks as though the resin's what's responsible for the general look. This doesn't have to be a universal application, you know, because you got your brown down there. Points will still be shiny because they were just thrown down there recently. Doesn't mean your skulls can have some of this on them either. Around here in the baseline or they're touching the ground. Or would they have sunken into the murk some? Even the baseline of these posts here, they get real murky with it. Yeah, 
be obscure the texture at the bottom of this thick paste. And not at all, but yeah. I remember in the swamp, right? You're uh, got all manner of vegetation dying off, fish bits, and, you know, alligator crap. There's no reason this wouldn't be murky like this. Look at that! You can get all the way into this step here and just realize that you missed a coin. That's all right. So we still got. Our golds and who not mixed out there. Let's grab a little bit of the Victorian brass. But looks like that. Didn't miss anything at all. Here. Muddied up. Excellent. Again, it's a subtle step. But, and that's probably Wednesday, so I don't think it's any greener stuff in here, too, so I'm not sure. A little variation going in there. Excellent. Getting on looking mighty muddy. This is actually probably our last step for the bottom here. We got our effects built up. All right. Some good stuff there. Beat the hell out of our brush. Now we're going to be moving to our enamels. So you remember at the top of the show, I briefly mentioned the 
Vallejo environment. Oh, I guess these are acrylics. Actually, it's the metal ones that are enamel. Just shake the bejesus out of it here because it's got a lot of pigments in it that do a lot of settling. And then we're just going to pull from the lid. Real simple. So these fellas are pretty robust acrylic sludges. I do with those. Grab the edge of our beater brush here, right? Start pulling them up towards the top. Focus really on the bottom of these things. Not with any real rhyme or reason or organizational structure. Just make sure that there's more on the bottom of the post than there is on the top of the posts. On account of the way they have weathered out here. Pull that up there. Start to get very skunk. It's really thick, deep green. Line out the bottoms. Just like that. That sludge to work its way in there. All these years of build up negligence. It's a very goth location for a photo shoot. Excellent. Nice little bit of casual wear going on there. Take a lighter green. Rhyme has developed over the years there. Greening out all these timbers, the algae. I'm going to concentrate this about midway. Keep it real, you know, loose. Just want to give this impression here. All this more and out. No right or wrong answer. However, whether do you think the dog should be?
course the two can meet in the middle. Really tie that all. <laughs> Build up a nice black one day, you know. You can see I'm trying to avoid following any kind of rhyme or reason with the strokes and the patterns. Sitting this dot won't decide for itself how long it's been sitting there. Go mix those bottoms in there. So it's kind of even series of transitions there. Start to develop that mixture of characters we're looking for. Bottom. There will be actual moss in addition to this kind of algae effect we're applying right now. Algae is part of our texture process here. Building up our layers of interest. These are only going to get better. Face painting tutorial. Cover everything I paint moving forward. If you like what you see, uh, subscribe. If I get a bunch of subscribers, I get more features. And, uh, I don't actually make, uh, you know, pennies a month doing this, which would uh, help incentivize the whole process. Just keeping this nice and greened out. Getting towards the end of this feed here because we're dead on.
couple of hours. I will definitely be back here later though. This evening for episode three. I mean it probably won't matter. If anyone is watching this, there's no reason you would watch these live or are watching these this evening. So by the time you get around to them, there might be forty of these. <laughs> Now let's see. Really. Find patches and develop the green, you know. Only you can really see where it goes. It's your world. Damn it. Figure I would learn from these though. All right. Said, I think I'm going to stop this episode right around here. And get some water or something to eat. Let all this cure up. And then we'll come back and we will paint the fish. Should be exciting next step. No wrong answers, algae bunny. You think something like that should be greener? Well, then it definitely should. Excellent. All right, folks. I'm going to sign off for a little while, but uh, thanks for watching, assuming you have. And, uh, you know, keep your uh, bristles damp.